We end here tonight with a sleeping giant, an ancient super volcano beneath Yellowstone National Park. It has been snoring for thousands of years, exhaling through the park's famous geysers. Yellowstone National Park has been a popular destination for visitors eager to experience its wildlife and breathtaking scenery. However, recent observations of increased magma activity have raised concerns about a potential volcanic eruption, leading park officials to close the paras. They are terrified. Join us as we reveal the life-threatening discovery that was made inside Yellowstone. Part 1. Tension in Yellowstone. There's some seriously spooky news from one of the park rangers about something terrifying going on beneath the ground. They've been keeping tabs on this volcano since way back in 1923. And guess what? The magma down there has been making the ground puff up and rise by about 10 inches. The rise stopped, showing that the magma was cooling and getting hard. This got the scientists, who've been eyeballing this sleeping monster, thinking it might be gearing up to wake up, to figure out what might happen if Yellowstone decides to blow its top. Scientists took a peek at the last three times it happened. All three eruptions were super huge. The most recent one was over 600,000 years ago, and you can still see the evidence all over Yellowstone National Park. The first eruption, around 2.1 million years ago at Huckleberry Ridge, spewed out about 580 cubic miles of volcanic ash, gases, magma, and other stuff. It's now officially the biggest eruption ever in Yellowstone and North America. The second one, Mesa Falls, happened 1.3 million years ago and formed Henry's Fork Caldera to the west of Yellowstone. It was the smallest of the three, but it still threw out about 67 cubic miles of volcanic ash. The third major eruption, called the Lava Creek Eruption, is the most recent one we know about. It didn't throw out as much stuff as Huckleberry Ridge, but it spread over a wider area. Now, with the ground swelling up, everyone's on edge, wondering if Yellowstone is getting ready for another big show. With the hot magma and other volcano stuff, a bunch of volcanic ash and gas shot out super forcefully. But the really scary part is that the monster's destruction didn't just stay in Yellowstone National Park. It spread out and covered most of the United States with hot magma and volcano junk. Some of the stuff from the explosion even ended up way down in Louisiana, which is hundreds of miles away from where it happened in Wyoming. These massive explosions made the Yellowstone volcano eat up everything around it, trees, mountains, and other closely related bodies. Then it caved in on itself making a big dent that's still there today, called the Yellowstone Caldera. It's like a spooky hole left behind. The last time something like this happened was with the Mount St. Helens volcano in 1980. That explosion killed 56 people and lots of animals, wrecking hundreds of square kilometers of land in Washington and Oregon. The St. Helens explosion is nothing compared to the last big explosion at Yellowstone. They say it was a thousand times more powerful than the St. Helens blast. Now, with Yellowstone acting up again, everyone's holding their breath and alert, wondering if it's about to blow like never before. Stories about past explosions have circled, stating that they must have covered a huge part of the land with super hot ash, melted rock, and bad gases that shot up high into the sky. The magma and gases rushed across everything fast, destroying everything and leaving the land covered in ash. People stated that the evidence can still be seen in a big dent from that explosion called the Yellowstone Caldera. It's like a hole that's 30 miles wide and 45 miles long, and a lot of volcanic stuff from the explosion in the Lava Creek Tuff area can be seen. Even though we all hope for the best, the signs from the land can't be ignored. A big volcanic explosion like the one over 600,000 years ago would be a huge disaster. Even experts can't be sure when it might happen, and it's something no one, not even a whole country, can get ready for properly. Now they're talking about more earthquakes happening around Yellowstone. They've had between 1,000 and 3,000 earthquakes every year, some small ones that no one feels. Scientists use fancy tools to check the magma pool below the ground. There's a place under Yellowstone National Park that's like a reservoir for magma, and they call it the magma chamber. The shakes, 
whether we feel them or not, help scientists figure out how fast the magma chamber is filling up. The stronger the earthquakes around the park, the more they think new magma is going into the chamber. It's tricky to know what these quakes mean for Yellowstone. Nobody can predict what Yellowstone will do next. There's not much else to say, except look at what happened in Yellowstone a long time ago. According to a Yellowstone National Park alert, there's this big dome-shaped thing in the ground that's constantly getting bigger. This is like proof that there's more volcanic activity under Yellowstone National Park. Because of this, they had to close the park to keep people safe in case of a volcanic explosion. It seems like it might happen sooner than it has in the past 600,000 years. Yellowstone's supervolcano, Earth's fiery secret. Deep in Yellowstone National Park, there's a bunch of awesome nature stuff, but there's also some really scary stuff. In the beautiful scenery, there are potential hazards, such as encounters with wildlife, exposure to harmful gases, extreme cold conditions, sudden lightning, falling trees, precarious ledges, water hazards, accidental firearm discharges, malfunctioning stoves, and, historically, instances of violence over the past 150 years. When examining the range of hazards in Yellowstone, a rather unsettling revelation emerges, encompassing the ordinary risks and those of a more supernatural nature. The reasons people kick the bucket are somehow tied at 12 for car crashes and heart attacks. It might give the shivers, but nature itself hides the real hazards in Yellowstone. It is a national treasure thousands flock to this time of year, but Yellowstone National Park is being hit with massive flooding. All entrances to the Montana park are closed. There's a concerning potential for a significant disaster. The possibility of a mega eruption from Yellowstone's supervolcano is a source of concern for many. Even though lots of folks don't know about the hidden hazards, Yellowstone's supervolcano is a threat that could wipe out life on Earth. The idea that the volcano might blow up in the next 100,000 years is starting to seem less like a guess, and scientists who thought Yellowstone was just sleeping are changing their minds. The countdown to a big disaster is ticking, making it kind of spooky to think humans might disappear. The authorities were compelled to close down the park when a park ranger reported that something unusual was happening inside the park. Could it be that the supervolcano has woken from its slumber? Strange happenings in Yellowstone. In July 1981, witnesses were horrified as they observed 24-year-old David Kerwin plunging headfirst into Yellowstone's boiling Celestian pool. Kerwin had been searching for his friend's Great Dane, Muzi, who had escaped from the back of a pickup truck and jumped into the scalding hot spring. With an estimated temperature of 200 degrees Fahrenheit, Kerwan quickly acknowledged his error, emerging from the scorching water within seconds and attempting to pull the dog to safety. Kerwan survived, but the dog did not. Kerwan's friend, involved in removing Kerwan's badly charred body from the rock shelf, suffered third-degree burns on his feet. Kerwan managed to stand up briefly before falling backward. His friend and another observer accompanied him to the parking lot for assistance. In a moment of desperation, Kerwin collapsed onto the creaking wooden walkway, reportedly turning to his friend and asking how terrible he looked. The severity of the situation manifested in Kerwin's eyes, which were entirely whited out as if shrouded in blindness, and his badly burnt skin was peeling away rapidly. A harrowing scene unfolded when another bystander hurriedly approached, attempting to remove Kerwin's shoe, only to witness his flesh unraveling in response. After this distressing incident, park rangers stumbled upon two sizable fragments of skin resembling human hands beside the steaming hot spring. Kerwin, bearing third-degree burns across his entire body, was urgently transported to the Old Faithful Clinic. There, in an attempt to alleviate his excruciating pain, a burn specialist could do little more than numb the pain. Tragically, Kerwin succumbed to his injuries the following morning in a Salt Lake City hospital. Regrettably, Moosey, the loyal Great Dane, did not emerge unscathed. Despite exhaustive efforts, Moosey's remains were never recovered, yet the oils from his body triggered minor eruptions in the water the subsequent day. Chapter The Record Book the profound and distressing account of Kirwan's demise stands as one of over 20 documented cases chronicled in the book Death in Yellowstone, 
Accidents and Foolhardiness in the First National Park by Lee H. Whittlesey. This multifaceted individual, a lawyer, a veteran Yellowstone guide, a park ranger, and a historian, crafted the book with a dual purpose, to provide legal safeguards for the park and to enlighten visitors about the myriad hidden and blatant perils that may be encountered within its boundaries. Throughout the narrative, Whittlesey persistently emphasizes that Yellowstone is not akin to a theme park, complete with docile animals and well-marked trails. But Yellowstone officials actually say lately there have been so many egregious actions, they were compelled to release a public statement urging visitors not to put themselves or the animals in danger. But rather a realm fraught with potential dangers, demanding utmost caution. Describing the park as full of hidden and obvious dangers, he felt the need to share his cautionary tale while also documenting the site's storied history. Surprisingly, Whittlesey discovered that the risk of drowning or being boiled alive in one of the park's 10,000 springs, geysers, mud pots, and steam vents far outweighed the danger of encountering a wild animal. He came across the unsettling fact that the alluring blue-green hues of the geysers and springs tended to draw people to their edges. The first thermal injury dated back to 1871, when Truman Everts, a member of the 1870 Washburn Expedition, decided to soak in a hot spring after being lost for 37 days. As the 1880s rolled in, an increase in park visitors resulted in a surge of hot springs-related accidents among both visitors and park staff. One of the most horrific incidents detailed in Whittlesey's book involved four Chinese laundrymen who were thrown into the air and scalded to death after a geyser burst one night. Acknowledging some flaws in the story, the author's account gained attention from national media sources. The National Enquirer ran a headline proclaiming, Boiled Chinaman in the Yellowstone Park region, featuring a sizable illustration depicting people, pigtails, and wash tubs being sprouted into the air. The latest recorded death occurred in 2016, when a 23-year-old individual from Portland, Oregon, slipped and fell into a hot spring near Porkchop Geyser. 23-year-old Colin Scott was trying to hot pot just before he fell into a scalding hot geyser earlier this year. Officials claim Scott's body disintegrated in the thermal pool located in Yellowstone National Park. The perilous history of the park continues, with that remains very much present. Volcanism in Yellowstone Park the volcanic activity in Yellowstone is thought to be connected to the somewhat older volcanic activity in the Snake River Plain. Yellowstone is considered the active part of a hotspot that has shifted northeast over time. The origin of this hotspot volcanism is debated. One theory suggests that a mantle plume caused the Yellowstone hotspot to move northeast, while another theory explains migrating hotspot volcanism as a result of the fragmentation and dynamics of the subducted Farallon plate in Earth's interior. The Yellowstone caldera is the largest volcanic system in North America, rivaled globally only by the Lake Toba caldera on Sumatra. It's labeled a supervolcano because the caldera formed through exceptionally large explosive eruptions. The magma chamber beneath Yellowstone is estimated to be a single connected chamber, approximately 60 kilometers long, 29 kilometers wide, and 4.8 to 11.3 kilometers deep. The present caldera resulted from a catastrophic eruption 640,000 years ago, releasing over 240 cubic miles of ash, rock, and pyroclastic materials. This eruption was over 1,000 times larger than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. It created a caldera nearly one kilometer deep and 72 by 45 kilometers in area, depositing the Lava Creek Tuff, a welded tuff geologic formation. The most powerful known eruption, occurring 2.1 million years ago, ejected 588 cubic miles of volcanic material, forming the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff and the Island Park Caldera. A smaller eruption, 1.3 million years ago, ejected 67 cubic miles of material, creating the Henry's Fork Caldera and depositing the Mesa Falls Tuff. Each of the three major eruptions released large amounts of ash that covered a significant portion of Central North America, falling hundreds of miles away. 
the ash and gases released into the atmosphere likely had substantial effects on global weather patterns and contributed to the extinction of some species, mainly in North America. Another eruption forming a caldera occurred about 160,000 years ago, shaping the relatively small caldera that holds the west thumb of Yellowstone Lake. Following the last super eruption, a series of smaller eruptive cycles occurred between 640,000 and 70,000 years ago, nearly filling the Yellowstone caldera with 80 different eruptions of rhyolitic lavas, obsidian cliffs, and basaltic lavas, sheep eater cliff. Lava layers are most visible at the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, where the Yellowstone River continues to carve into the ancient lava flows. The canyon has a classic V-shaped valley, indicating erosion caused by river activity rather than glaciation. Each eruption is part of a cycle culminating in the partial collapse of the volcano's partly emptied magma chamber roof. This collapse forms a depressed area called a caldera, releasing extensive amounts of volcanic material, usually through fissures encircling the caldera. The time between the last three cataclysmic eruptions in the Yellowstone area has ranged from 600,000 to 800,000 years, but the limited number of such major eruptions does not allow for an accurate prediction of future volcanic events. Part 2. Earthquakes in Yellowstone Yellowstone National Park is characterized by a significant number of small earthquakes occurring annually, the majority of which go unnoticed by human observers. Notably, around two-thirds of these seismic events take place in a specific region situated between Hebgen Lake and the Yellowstone Caldera, it's still early in the season, but Yellowstone National Park has already seen several concerning interactions involving visitors and wildlife. Following a buried fracture zone left behind by the eruption that occurred 2.1 million years ago. Throughout historical times, Yellowstone has experienced six earthquakes with a magnitude of six or greater, with the most memorable being the 7.2 magnitude Hebgen Lake earthquake in 1959 just beyond the northwest boundary of the park. This particular seismic event triggered a massive landslide, resulting in a partial dam collapse on Hebgen Lake and the formation of a new lake downstream, known as Earthquake Lake. The incident claimed 28 lives and caused extensive property damage. Remarkably, the earthquake also induced eruptions in some geysers. The emergence of large cracks in the ground emitting steam and the transformation of clear water hot springs into muddy ones. The stress generated by this seismic activity is theorized to contribute to the ongoing seismic events in the northwestern section of Yellowstone. Another notable earthquake, measuring 6.1 in magnitude, occurred inside the park on June 30, 1975, resulting in minimal damage. In 1985, an earthquake swarm was detected, encompassing 3,000 minor earthquakes in the northwestern section of the park. This swarm was attributed to the minor subsidence of the Yellowstone caldera. Starting on April 30, 2007, 16 small earthquakes, with magnitudes reaching up to 2.7, occurred in the Yellowstone caldera over several days. Such earthquake swarms are a common occurrence, with 70 recorded between 1983 and 2008. In December 2008, over 250 earthquakes were measured over four days beneath Yellowstone Lake, the largest of which had a magnitude of 3.9. In January 2010, more than 250 earthquakes were detected over two days. Regular reporting on seismic activity in Yellowstone National Park is provided by the Earthquake Hazards Program of the U.S. Geological Survey. One of the more significant recent seismic events took place on March 30, 2014, when a magnitude 4.8 earthquake struck near the Norris Basin, almost at the geographical center of Yellowstone, at 6.34 a.m. Fortunately, there were no reports of damage. This event stands as the most substantial earthquake to impact the park since February 22, 1980. Endangered Wildlife Species Yellowstone is widely acclaimed as the premier megafauna wildlife habitat in the contiguous United States. The park hosts an impressive array of nearly 60 mammal species, including the Rocky Mountain Wolf, Coyote, Canadian Lynx, Cougars, and both Black and Grizzly Bears. Other notable large mammals found in Yellowstone encompass Bison, 
commonly referred to as buffalo, elk, moose, mule deer, white-tailed deer, mountain goat, pronghorn, and bighorn sheep. The Yellowstone Park bison herd stands out as the largest public herd of American bison in the United States, representing one of the last strongholds for this species. While bison populations once ranged between 30 and 60 million individuals throughout North America, Yellowstone now plays a crucial role in their preservation. The herd's numbers increased from less than 50 in the park in 1902 to around 4,000 by 2003. Despite reaching a peak of 4,900 animals in 2005, the population fluctuated, dropping to 3,000 in 2008 due to a harsh winter and controversial brucellosis management strategies that led to the culling of hundreds. Considered one of only four free-roaming and genetically pure bison herds on public lands in North America, the Yellowstone Park bison herd shares this distinction with herds in Utah's Henry Mountains, Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota, and Elk Island National Park in Alberta. Concerns among ranchers about disease transmission, particularly brucellosis, have led to the regular corralling of bison herds that venture beyond park boundaries. The disease, originating from European cattle, poses minimal risks to park bison, and there are no documented cases of transmission to domestic livestock. Animal rights activists decry the culling practices, arguing against their necessity. The history of wolves in Yellowstone reveals a complex relationship. In the early 20th century, wolves were systematically exterminated from the park to protect elk populations. The U.S. Congress allocated funds for this purpose, and by 1926, 136 wolves had been killed. This extermination continued until 1935, when the National Park Service ceased the practice. The passage of the Endangered Species Act in 1973 marked a turning point, leading to the listing of wolves as one of the first protected mammal species. With the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone, the balance of the ecosystem shifted, and the coyote, having become the top canine predator in the wolves' absence, faced new challenges in controlling the population of larger prey animals, increasing lame and sick megafauna. In the 1990s, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service made a significant and controversial decision to reintroduce northwestern wolves from Canada into Yellowstone National Park. This effort proved successful, with wolf populations remaining relatively stable. A 2005 survey indicated the presence of 13 wolf packs, totaling 118 individuals in Yellowstone and 326 in the entire ecosystem. These figures were lower than those reported in 2004, potentially due to wolf migration to nearby areas, particularly observed in the substantial increase in the Montana population during that period. Almost all documented wolves were descendants of the 66 wolves reintroduced in 1995-96. The successful recovery of wolf populations in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho led to the removal of the northern Rocky Mountain wolf population from the endangered species list on February 27, 2008. As of January 2023, there are at least 108 wolves in the park in 10 packs highlighting their central role in the broader Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Black bears are common in Yellowstone and were once symbols of the park due to visitor interactions with bears starting in 1910. However, since the 1960s, feeding and close contact with bears have been prohibited to reduce their reliance on human foods. Yellowstone is one of the few places in the U.S. where black bears coexist with grizzly bears. Black bear sightings are most frequent in the park's northern ranges, and the Beckler area in the southwestern corner. Approximately 700 grizzly bears were estimated to live in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as of 2017, with about 150 of them residing wholly or partially within Yellowstone National Park. Initially listed as a threatened species in the contiguous United States in 1975, the grizzly bear was delisted in 2007. However, this decision faced legal challenges and in 2009, a federal district judge overturned the delisting. The grizzly was again removed from the endangered species list in 2017, but a judge ruled in September 2018 that the bear's protections must be fully restored. 
contesting the decision to delist. Despite these legal battles, hunting remains prohibited within Yellowstone National Park, although hunters with legal permits can transport carcasses through the park. Elk populations in Yellowstone number more than 30,000, making them the largest population of any large mammal species in the park. However, the northern elk herd has significantly decreased since the mid-1990s, attributed to wolf predation and associated factors, such as elk shifting to more forested areas to evade predation. This behavior change has made it challenging for researchers to accurately count the elk. The northern herd migrates west into southwestern Montana in winter, while the southern herd migrates southward, with many wintering on the National Elk Refuge southeast of Grand Teton National Park. The southern elk herd's migration is the largest remaining mammalian migration in the U.S. outside of Alaska. In 2003, tracks of a female lynx and her cub were discovered and followed for over 2 miles (3.2 kilometer) in Yellowstone. Subsequent analysis of fecal material and other evidence confirmed the presence of lynx in the park. However, no visual confirmation was made. Lynx had not been seen in Yellowstone since 1998, but DNA from hair samples obtained in 2001 confirmed that lynx were at least transient to the park. Other less commonly seen mammals in Yellowstone include the mountain lion and wolverine, the mountain lion has an estimated population of only 25 individuals park-wide, while accurate population figures for wolverines are not known. These uncommon and rare mammals contribute valuable information about the health of protected lands like Yellowstone, assisting managers in deciding how best to preserve habitats. 18 species of fish inhabit Yellowstone, with the Yellowstone cutthroat trout being highly sought by anglers. However, this species has faced threats since the 1980s, including the suspected illegal introduction of lake trout into Yellowstone Lake, an invasive species that prey on the smaller cutthroat trout. Ongoing drought conditions and the accidental introduction of a parasite causing whirling disease have further impacted the cutthroat trout population. Since 2001, all native sport fish species caught in Yellowstone waterways are subject to catch and release regulations. Yellowstone is also home to seven species of reptiles, including the painted turtle, rubber boa, prairie rattlesnake, bull snake, sagebrush lizard, valley garter snake, and wandering garter snake. Additionally, four species of amphibians are found in the park, including the boreal chorus frog, tiger salamander, western toad, and Columbia spotted frog. 311 species of birds have been reported in Yellowstone, with almost half of them nesting in the park. In 1999, 26 pairs of nesting bald eagles were documented. Rare sightings of whooping cranes have been recorded, although only three of these species are known to live in the Rocky Mountains, out of 385 known worldwide. Other birds classified as species of special concern due to their rarity in Yellowstone include the common loon, harlequin duck, osprey, peregrine falcon, and the trumpeter swan. All the hot springs, volcanoes, and earthquakes also pose a threat to the lives of the animals, thereby reducing their numbers and making them a source of safety. Forest fire. Wildfires are a natural part of most ecosystems in Yellowstone, and indigenous plants have adapted various strategies to cope with them. Douglas fir, for instance, has a thick bark protecting the inner section from fires. Lodgepole pines, the most common tree species, have cones that open due to fire heat, allowing seeds to disperse. Fire helps clear dead wood, reducing obstacles for lodgepole pines. Other tree species like subalpine fir, Engelmann spruce, whitebark pine, and aspen trees also have specific adaptations to fire conditions. Historically, Grasslands in Yellowstone burned approximately every 20 to 25 years, while forests experienced fire about every 300 years under natural conditions. Around 35 natural forest fires are ignited annually by lightning, with an additional 6 to 10 started by people, often accidentally. Yellowstone has three fire lookout towers, including one atop Mount Washburn accessible to the public. Park employees and visitors report smoke or flames to monitor and manage fires effectively. The park focuses on fire management, 
considering factors such as deadwood quantity, soil and tree moisture, and weather conditions to identify vulnerable areas. The policy is to suppress all human-caused fires and evaluate natural fires based on their impact on the ecosystem. Fire management also involves controlled burns. Prescribed fires deliberately started to remove dead timber under controlled conditions. Natural fires are sometimes allowed to burn if they pose no immediate threat. Over the past 30 years, more than 300 natural fires have been permitted to burn naturally. The Fire Management Plan, implemented in 2014, permits natural fires to burn if they don't immediately threaten lives and property. This approach contrasts with earlier land management policies that viewed all forest fires as purely destructive, leading to fire suppression and an increase in dead forests, which, in turn, contributed to more severe fires. The current understanding recognizes fire as an integral part of the ecosystem, and management strategies aim to balance fire's role with the safety of visitors and structures. In the spring of 1988, the weather brought plenty of rain, making it a wet season. However, as summer rolled in, a drought settled over the northern Rockies, marking it as the driest year on record up to that point. The lush growth of grasses and plants, nurtured by the abundant spring moisture, soon faced a dramatic shift as the landscape transformed into dry tinder. The National Park Service, recognizing the imminent threat, initiated firefighting efforts to control the spreading fires. However, the severity of the drought posed significant challenges to suppression. Between July 15 and 24, 1988, fires rapidly expanded from 8,500 acres to a staggering 99,000 acres within the entire Yellowstone region, encompassing areas beyond the park boundaries. On the park's land alone, the fires surged to unprecedented levels. By the end of July, the fires had spiraled out of control. Massive fires merged, culminating in the single worst day on August 20, 1988, when more than 150,000 acres succumbed to the flames. Seven substantial fires were responsible for a staggering 95% of the total 793,000 acres burned over the subsequent months. The firefighting efforts incurred a hefty cost of $120 million, involving the deployment of 25,000 firefighters and U.S. military forces. The battle against the fires persisted until winter finally arrived, bringing with it the salvation of snow that extinguished the last lingering flames. However, the toll was significant, with 67 structures destroyed and millions of dollars in damages incurred. Though there were no civilian casualties, the firefighting personnel faced tragedy as two associated individuals lost their lives in the line of duty. Contrary to initial media reports and widespread speculation, the impact on park animals was relatively limited. Surveys indicated that approximately 345 elk, out of an estimated 40,000, 50,000, 36 deer, 12 moose, 6 black bears, and 9 bison, had perished. Drawing lessons from the 1988 fires, land management agencies across the United States implemented changes in fire management policies. By 1992, Yellowstone had adapted to a new fire management plan, incorporating stricter guidelines for the handling of natural fires. The collective experience and insights gained from the 1988 fires played a crucial role in shaping more effective approaches to fire management ensuring the protection of valuable ecosystems and wildlife habitats. Could the climate be the cause? Yellowstone's climate is intricately shaped by its varied elevations, resulting in temperature fluctuations throughout the year. Lower elevations generally enjoy warmer conditions consistently. The record high temperature, reaching 99 Dej Fahrenheit, occurred in 2002, while the coldest recorded temperature plummeted to 66 degrees Fahrenheit in 1933. During the summer months from June to early September, daytime highs typically range from 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, with nighttime lows occasionally dropping below freezing, especially at higher altitudes. Summer afternoons often feature thunderstorms, adding a dynamic element to the climate. In spring and fall, Temperatures fluctuate between 30 and 60 Deji Fahrenheit, 
with nighttime temperatures dipping into the teens and single digits. Winters in Yellowstone are characterized by high temperatures ranging from 0 to 20 dG Fahrenheit, with nighttime temperatures often falling below 0 dG Fahrenheit for most of the season. Yellowstone experiences variable precipitation, ranging from 15 inches annually near Mammoth Hot Springs to a substantial 80 inches in the southwestern sections of the park. The park's precipitation is significantly influenced by the moisture channel formed by the Snake River Plain to the west, a feature shaped by Yellowstone itself. Snowfall is possible in any month of the year, with the most common occurrences between November and April. Yellowstone Lake, for instance, witnesses an average of 150 inches of snow annually, while higher elevations can receive twice that amount. The climate classification at Yellowstone Lake falls into the subarctic category, DFC, according to the Koppen-Geiger climate classification. Meanwhile, at the park headquarters, the classification is identified as Humid Continental, DFB. While tornadoes are rare in Yellowstone, a notable exception occurred on July 21, 1987, when the most powerful tornado recorded in Wyoming touched down in the Teton wilderness of Bridger Teton National Forest and hit Yellowstone National Park. Known as the Teton Yellowstone Tornado, it was classified as an F4, boasting wind speeds estimated between 207 and 260 miles per hour. This tornado left a path of destruction 1 to 2 miles wide and 24 miles long, leveling 15,000 acres. In June 2022, due to intense rainfall, the park had to take the step of closing its entrances and evacuating visitors. This was in response to unprecedented flooding that led to multiple failures in roads and bridges, widespread power outages, and even mudslides. Stunning pictures this morning out of Yellowstone. The Yellowstone River is at its highest elevation in more than 100 years. Unprecedented rainfall causing heavy flooding and rock slides in the park. The situation was exacerbated by a combination of heavy rain and the rapid melting of snow, causing the Yellowstone River to surge to a new record height of 13.88 feet. This surpassed the previous record set in 1918 at 11.5 feet. The Lamar River also experienced significant flooding, reaching a height of 16.7 feet surpassing the record set in 1996 at 1215 feet. The aftermath of the flooding included extensive damage to roads and bridges, as well as disruptions to essential infrastructure systems, such as electricity, water, and wastewater systems. Initially, there were concerns about the park's ability to reopen the north entrance by Gardner MT and the northeast entrance near Cook City MT for the rest of the 2022 season. However, after a nine-day closure, the park partially reopened on Wednesday, June 22nd. Remarkably, the north entrance even opened two days ahead of schedule on October 30th. The northeast entrance followed suit, reopening on October 15th. To manage the influx of visitors, which typically reached nearly one million per month during the summer, the park implemented temporary restrictions on entry for cars based on license plates. This was a strategic move to maintain order and safety within the park while accommodating those who wish to experience its natural beauty. The challenges faced by the park in the summer of 2022 underscore the unpredictable nature of weather events and the resilience required to overcome such adversities, ultimately allowing one of nature's wonders to continue welcoming visitors from near and far. Part 3 the hot water fountains and the water heating system. Yellowstone National Park boasts numerous geothermal features, with the most renowned being the Old Faithful Geyser in the Upper Geyser Basin. Other notable geysers in the same basin include Castle Geyser, Lion Geyser, Beehive Geyser, Grand Geyser, Giant Geyser, Riverside Geyser, and many more. The park is home to the tallest active geyser globally, the Steamboat Geyser, in the Norris Geyser Basin. A study conducted in 2011 revealed that Yellowstone has at least 1,183 geysers, with an average of 465 being active in a given year. 
The park encompasses over 10,000 geothermal features, including hot springs, mud pots, and fumaroles, making up over half of the world's geysers and hydrothermal features. To monitor the geological processes of the Yellowstone Plateau volcanic field and disseminate information about potential hazards, the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory was established in May 2001 through collaboration between the U.S. Geological Survey, Yellowstone National Park, and the University of Utah. In 2003, changes at the Norris Geyser Basin led to the temporary closure of some trails due to observed new fumaroles, enhanced geyser activity, and rising water temperatures. Some geysers became superheated, transforming into purely steaming features. Reports from a U.S. Geological Survey project in the same year identified a structural dome beneath Yellowstone Lake, suggesting past uplifts but no immediate threat of a volcanic eruption. A biologist discovered five dead bison on March 10, 2004, which had inhaled toxic geothermal gases trapped in the Norris Geyser Basin by a seasonal atmospheric inversion. This event coincided with an upsurge in earthquake activity in April 2004. In 2006, it was reported that the Mallard Lake Dome and the Sour Creek Dome, areas known for significant ground movement changes, had risen at a rate of 1.5 to 2.4 inches per year from mid-2004 through 2006, continuing at a reduced rate as of late 2007. Despite media attention and speculation, experts assured the public that there was no increased risk of a volcanic eruption soon highlighting the dynamic nature of the Yellowstone hydrothermal system. The Yellowstone Park Yellowstone National Park is a national park located in the western United States, mainly in the northwest corner of Wyoming, extending into Montana and Idaho. Established by the 42nd U.S. Congress with the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act, it was signed into law by President Ulysses S. Grant on March 1, 1872. Recognized as the first national park in the U.S. and often considered the world's first, Yellowstone is renowned for its wildlife and numerous geothermal features, including the popular Old Faithful Geyser. The park encompasses various biomes, with the subalpine forest being the most prevalent, situated within the south-central Rockies forest eco-region. Despite Native Americans inhabiting the Yellowstone region for at least 11,000 years, Organized exploration began in the late 1860s, with the U.S. Department of the Interior initially overseeing park management. Columbus Delano became the first Secretary of the Interior to supervise the park. The U.S. Army assumed control from 1886 to 1916. In 1917, management was transferred to the newly established National Park Service. The park's vast area of 3,068.44 Eskimi includes lakes, canyons, rivers, and mountain ranges. Yellowstone Lake, centered over the Yellowstone Caldera, the continent's largest supervolcano, is one of North America's largest high-elevation lakes. The caldera, considered dormant, has erupted forcefully several times in the last two million years, fueling well over half of the world's geysers and hydrothermal features in Yellowstone. Yellowstone's landscape, shaped by volcanic activity, is covered with lava flows and rocks from eruptions. The park is the focal point of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the largest nearly intact ecosystem in the Earth's northern temperate zone. Designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1978, the park hosts a diverse array of mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians, including some endangered or threatened species. The park features the largest and most famous megafauna in the contiguous United States, with grizzly bears, cougars, wolves, and free-ranging herds of bison and elk. The Yellowstone Park Bison Herd is the oldest and largest public bison herd in the country. Yellowstone offers a range of recreational activities, such as hiking, camping, boating, fishing, and sightseeing. Paved roads provide convenient access to major geothermal areas, lakes, and waterfalls. During winter, guided tours using snow coaches or snowmobiles are popular among visitors. The park's dynamic environment, including forest fires, 
adds to its natural diversity and appeal. Yellowstone National Park, nestled in the heart of the United States, stands as a testament to the beauty of nature and the enduring allure of the great outdoors. Renowned as one of the most popular national parks in the country, Yellowstone has been a magnet for visitors since the mid-1960s, consistently drawing in at least two million tourists each year. This natural wonder has witnessed a steady rise in annual visitation, reaching an impressive 3.5 million during the 10 years from 2007 to 2016, with a peak record of 4,157,077 ,007 recreational visitors in 2016. The month of July emerges as the pinnacle of activity for Yellowstone National Park, marking the busiest period when the park teams with enthusiastic explorers. To cater to the influx of visitors, a dedicated workforce of 3,700 employees collaborates with Yellowstone National Park concessionaires during peak summer levels. These concessionaires expertly manage nine hotels and lodges, offering a total of 2,038 hotel rooms and cabins. Beyond accommodations, they oversee essential amenities, such as gas stations, stores, and a significant portion of the campgrounds, ensuring a seamless and enjoyable experience for all. Complementing the efforts of concessionaires, the National Park Service plays a pivotal role in the preservation and maintenance of Yellowstone's diverse infrastructure. With 800 employees working either permanently or seasonally, the National Park Service contributes to the seamless functioning of the park. This joint effort reflects a commitment to providing an immersive and sustainable experience for visitors while safeguarding the park's natural treasures. Despite these challenges, Yellowstone offers an extensive network of 310 miles of paved roads, accessible through five different entrances. Public transportation is not available within the park, but numerous tour companies provide guided, including self-guided motorized transport options, allowing visitors to explore the breathtaking landscapes with ease. Facilities in popular areas such as Old Faithful, Canyon, and Mammoth Hot Springs witness heightened activity during the summer months, attracting a considerable number of visitors. However, the increased traffic, compounded by road construction or wildlife observation, may lead to occasional delays, emphasizing the need for careful planning and patience. The National Park Service maintains nine visitor centers and museums, overseeing the preservation of historical structures and nearly 2,000 buildings within the park. Notable landmarks, including the Old Faithful Inn, built from 1903 to 1904, and the entire Fort Yellowstone, Mammoth Hot Springs Historic District, contribute to the park's rich heritage. Fort Yellowstone offers a captivating historical and educational tour, shedding light on the evolution of the National Park Service and the park itself. In response to the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, certain interpretive programs, including campfire programs, guided walks, and presentations were temporarily suspended in 2021. Camping enthusiasts can choose from a dozen campgrounds, offering over 2,000 campsites within Yellowstone. Additionally, camping is permitted in surrounding national forests and Grand Teton National Park to the south. For those seeking a more immersive experience, backcountry campsites, accessible only by foot or horseback, require a permit. With an extensive network of 1 for 100 miles of hiking trails, Yellowstone beckons adventurers to explore its diverse terrain. The National Park Service maintains a year-round clinic at Mammoth Hot Springs, providing essential emergency services throughout the year. This commitment to visitor well-being underscores the park's dedication to ensuring a safe and enjoyable experience for all who venture into its realms. In the early days of the park, a unique and somewhat perilous practice was encouraged, allowing visitors to feed bears. This led to numerous injuries, as visitors sought photo opportunities with bears that had learned to beg for food. Recognizing the dangers, park officials shifted their policy in 1970, initiating a robust program to educate the public on the perils of close contact with bears. The aim was also to eliminate opportunities for bears to find food in campgrounds and trash collection areas. While observing bears has become more challenging in recent years, the number of human injuries and deaths has seen a significant decline. 
The eighth recorded bear-related death in the park's history occurred in August 2015. Beyond the borders of Yellowstone, the region boasts additional protected lands, including Caribou Targhee, Gallatin, Custer, Shoshone, and Bridger Teton National Forests. The National Park Service's John D. Rockefeller, J.R. Memorial Parkway to the south, leads to the majestic Grand Teton National Park. For those seeking scenic routes, the famed Beartooth Highway provides access from the northeast, promising spectacular high-altitude scenery. Nearby communities such as West Yellowstone, Montana, Cody, Wyoming, Red Lodge, Montana, Ashton, Idaho, and Gardner, Montana, offer gateways to the park's wonders. Access to Yellowstone is facilitated by air transport, with the closest options being Bozeman, Montana, Billings, Montana, Jackson, Cody, Wyoming, or Idaho Falls, Idaho. For those seeking a larger metropolitan area, Salt Lake City, 320 miles to the south, serves as the nearest hub. This seamless integration of accessibility and preservation underscores Yellowstone's commitment to providing a harmonious balance between exploration and conservation, ensuring the park's enduring legacy for generations to come. Part 4. History of the Yellow Park The park has the starting point of the Yellowstone River, and it got its old name from there. Back in the 1700s, French trappers called the river Rochechon, probably translating the Hidatsa name Mitsi Adazi to Yellowstone River. Later, American trappers changed the French name to English Yellowstone. People often think the river was named after yellow rocks in the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, but the Native American name source is not clear. People started living in the park about 11,000 years ago when Native Americans began hunting and fishing. In the 1950s, during the building of the post office in Gardner, Montana, they found a Clovis obsidian point that was about 11,000 years old. These early people, from the Clovis culture, used a lot of obsidian in the park to make tools and weapons. Yellowstone obsidian arrowheads have been found far away in the Mississippi Valley, showing there was regular trade between local tribes and tribes in the east. When Lewis and Clark came to Montana in 1805, they met the Nez Perce, Crow, and Shoshone tribes who told them about the Yellowstone region, but they didn't explore it. In 1806, John Coulter, a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition, left to join a group of fur trappers. After parting ways with the others in 1807, Coulter passed through a part of what would later become the park during the winter of 1807-1808. He saw at least one geothermal area in the northeastern part of the park, near Tower Fall. Surviving wounds from a battle with the Crow and Blackfoot tribes in 1809, Coulter described a place of fire and brimstone. But most people thought he was delirious. This supposedly mystical place earned the nickname Coulter's Hell. For the next 40 years, reports from mountain men and trappers told of boiling mud, steaming rivers, and petrified trees. But many believed these stories were myths. After an 1856 journey, mountain man Jim Bridger also thought to be the first or second European American to see the Great Salt Lake, told about seeing hot springs, shooting water, and a mountain of glass and yellow rock. People mostly ignored these stories because Bridger was known for telling tall tales. In 1859, a U.S. Army surveyor named Captain William F. Reynolds started a two-year survey of the southern central Rockies. After spending the winter in Wyoming, in May 1860, Reynolds and his group, including geologist Ferdinand V. Hayden and guide Jim Bridger, tried to cross the Continental Divide over two ocean plateau from the Wind River area in northwest Wyoming. Heavy spring snows stopped them, but if they had crossed, they would have been the first organized survey to enter the Yellowstone region. The American Civil War made it hard to do more organized explorations until the late 1860s. The first detailed trip to the Yellowstone area was the Cook Folsom Peterson Expedition of 1869, with three privately funded explorers. The Folsom Group followed the Yellowstone River to Yellowstone Lake. The Folsom Party wrote a journal, and based on the information, a group of Montana residents organized the Washburn-Langford Doan Expedition in 1870. It was led by the Surveyor General of Montana, Henry Washburn, 
and included Nathaniel P. Langford, who later became known as National Park Langford, and a U.S. Army group led by Lieutenant Gustavus Doan. The expedition spent about a month exploring the area, collecting samples, and naming interesting places. A writer and lawyer from Montana named Cornelius Hedges, who was part of the Washburn expedition, suggested that the area should be kept safe and preserved as a national park. He wrote detailed articles about what he saw for the Helena Herald newspaper from 1870 to 1871. Hedges repeated comments made in October 1865 by acting Montana Territorial Governor Thomas Francis Maher, who had previously said that the area should be protected. Others also had similar ideas. In 1871, Jay Cook, a businessman wanting to attract tourists to the region, wrote a letter to Ferdinand V. Hayden, encouraging him to include it in his official survey report. Cook mentioned that his friend, Congressman William D. Kelly, had also proposed Congress pass a bill reserving the Great Geyser Basin as a public park forever. Park establishment. In 1871, 11 years after his unsuccessful first attempt, Ferdinand versus Hayden finally got the chance to explore the region. With support from the government, he went back with a second larger expedition known as the Hayden Geological Survey of 1871. He put together a detailed report featuring big pictures by William Henry Jackson and paintings by Thomas Moran. This report played a key role in persuading the U.S. Congress to keep this area away from public auction. On March 1, 1872, President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Act of Dedication Law, officially creating Yellowstone National Park. Although Hayden wasn't the only one thinking about making a park in the area, he was its first and most passionate supporter. He believed in reserving the area as a place of enjoyment for the benefit of the people and cautioned against those who might come and exploit these beautiful specimens. Worried that the area could suffer the same fate as Niagara Falls, he argued that the site should remain as free as the air or water. In his report to the Committee on Public Lands, he warned that if the bill didn't become law, vandals waiting to enter this wonderland would quickly ruin these remarkable curiosities, which nature took thousands of years to create. Hayden and his 1871 team saw Yellowstone as a special place that should be open for further study. He also wanted to preserve it for others to enjoy. In 1873, Congress authorized and funded a survey to find a wagon route to the park from the south, completed by the Jones Expedition of 1873. Eventually, railroads and later on automobiles would make visiting the park possible. The park wasn't set aside only for ecological reasons. Hayden envisioned something similar to the scenic resorts and baths in England, Germany, and Switzerland. In the early years of Yellowstone National Park, there was significant opposition from residents. Some locals were concerned that the regional economy would struggle if there were strict federal restrictions on resource development or settlement within the park boundaries. Local entrepreneurs advocated for reducing the park's size so that activities like mining, hunting, and logging could take place. Many bills were introduced into Congress by Montana representatives aiming to lift the federal land use restrictions. After the park was officially formed, Nathaniel Langford became the park's first superintendent in 1872, appointed by Secretary of Interior Columbus Delano, who was the initial overseer and controller of the park. Langford served for five years but faced challenges as he was denied a salary, funding, and staff. He needed more means to improve the land or adequately protect the park. Without formal policies or regulations, he had limited legal tools to enforce protection, making Yellowstone susceptible to poachers, vandals, and those seeking to exploit its resources. In his 1872 report to the Secretary of the Interior, Langford addressed the practical problems park administrators were encountering and correctly predicted that Yellowstone would become a major international attraction requiring ongoing government stewardship. In 1874, both Langford and Delano proposed the creation of a federal agency to protect the extensive park, but Congress rejected the idea. In 1875, Colonel William Ludlow, who had previously explored areas of Montana under the command of George Armstrong Custer, was tasked with organizing and leading an expedition to Montana and the newly established Yellowstone Park. Ludlow's report of a reconnaissance to the Yellowstone National Park 
included observations about lawlessness and the exploitation of park resources. The report also featured letters and attachments from other expedition members, including naturalist and mineralogist George Bird Grinnell. George Bird Grinnell documented the poaching of buffalo, deer, elk, and antelope for hides, stating that, it is estimated that during the winter of 1874 to 1875, not less than 3,000 buffalo and mule deer suffer even more severely than the elk and the antelope nearly as much. Due to these challenges, Langford was compelled to resign in 1877. After Langford's departure, Philetus Norris volunteered for the position, having witnessed land management issues during his travels through Yellowstone. Congress finally decided to provide a salary for the superintendent's position and minimal funding to operate the park. Norris used these funds to improve access to the park by constructing various crude roads and facilities. In 1880, Harry Yunt was appointed as a gamekeeper to combat poaching and vandalism in the park. Yunt, the first national park ranger, had previously explored the mountainous regions of present-day Wyoming, including the Grand Tetons, after joining F. V. Hayden's Geological Survey in 1873. Yunt's Peak, at the head of the Yellowstone River, was named in his honor. However, these measures proved insufficient in protecting the park, as neither Norris nor the three subsequent superintendents were given adequate manpower or resources. During the 1870s and 1880s, Native American tribes were effectively excluded from the national park, with the Eastern Shoshone, known as Sheep Eaters, being the only year-round residents. They left the area under the terms of a treaty negotiated in 1868, in which the Sheep Eaters ceded their lands but retained the right to hunt in Yellowstone. The United States never ratified the treaty and refused to recognize the claims of the Sheep Eaters or any other tribe that had used Yellowstone. In late August 1877, the Nez Perce Band associated with Chief Joseph, totaling about 750 people, passed through Yellowstone National Park in 13 days while being pursued by the U.S. Army. This occurred approximately two weeks after the Battle of the Big Hole. Some Nez Perce members were friendly to tourists and other park visitors, while others were not. During this passage, nine park visitors were briefly taken captive, and despite orders from Joseph and other chiefs not to harm anyone, at least two people were killed, and several were wounded. Encounters took place in Lower Geyser Basin and east along a branch of the Firehole River to Mary Mountain and beyond. In memory of their trail through the area, that stream was named Nez Perce Creek. In 1878, a group of Bannocks entered the park, causing concern for Superintendent Philetus Norris. Following the Sheep Eater Indian War of 1879, Norris built a fort to prevent Native Americans from entering the national park. The Northern Pacific Railroad built a train station in Livingston, Montana, as a gateway terminus connecting to the northern entrance area in 1883, leading to increased visitation from 300 in 1872 to 5,000 in 1883. The spur line, completed in the fall of that year from Livingston to Cinnabar, connected to Mammoth, and in 1902 it was extended to Gardiner Station, where passengers could also switch to a stagecoach. Visitors during these early years faced poor and dusty roads with limited services, and automobiles were first admitted in phases, starting in 1915. By 1901, a Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy connection opened via Cody, and in 1908, a Union Pacific Railroad connection to West Yellowstone was established, followed by a 1927 Milwaukee Road connection to Gallatin Gateway near Bozeman also allowing motorcoach transportation via West Yellowstone. Rail visitation declined considerably by World War II and ceased regular service in favor of automobiles around the 1960s, although special excursions occasionally continued into the early 1980s. Poaching and natural resource destruction continued until the U.S. Army arrived at Mammoth Hot Springs in 1886 and established Camp Sheridan, later renamed Fort Yellowstone. On May 7, 1894, the Boone and Crockett Club, through individuals like George G. Vest, Arnold Haig, William Hallett Phillips, W.A. Wadsworth, Archibald Rogers, Theodore Roosevelt, and George Bird Grinnell, 
successfully enacted the Park Protection Act, which saved the park. The Lacey Act of 1900 provided legal support for prosecuting poachers. With funding and manpower, the Army developed policies and regulations for public access while safeguarding park wildlife and natural resources. When the National Park Service was established in 1916, many Army-developed management principles were adopted. Control was transferred from the Army to the National Park Service on October 31, 1918. As Yellowstone plans for the safety of its tourists, they are also deliberating on conditions that would be best for the betterment of the park. Also, in that manner, we have made plans for the safety of your phones, which are our brand new Tough Case iPhone cases. Discover them right now by clicking on your screen or checking the first link in the description. Thank you for watching this video. While you are still here, click the video on your screen to see more mind-blowing videos like this one.